Welcome to the conclusion of the epic episode 4.0 of the mildly amusing, intensely insightful, no talk show, the foundational mindset for treating each other and self. Last time we talked about assume good intent and honor human frailty. And today we will tackle champion human potential. Dad, you have the floor. What a great intro, Nikki. Your practice paid off. Now, find a way to make it even better. Did you notice that I just called upon a wonderful human ability to help Nikki reach her full potential? Many consider this ability a negative emotion to avoid. But in my book, it's a catalyst to help reach our full potential. We call it regret. Regret is a tool we use to improve. We use it when saying things like, now that I think about it, I could have done that or said this, or holy guacamole, I should have bought it here instead. The idea is that we learn from our mistakes. It's our own built-in auto-correction, like artificial intelligence, except that there's nothing artificial about it. Then why do some people, whom I assume have good intent, espouse the statement no regrets? To me, it seems to promote that we not own or learn from our past mistakes. Or maybe that we live perfectly from now on to have no regrets later. Or it gives us license to do whatever we want with no associated remorse. Try as I might. I couldn't envision a scenario in which the statement no regrets has any value. Rather than digging my heels, I decided to consider the views of those that espouse it. What I found proves quite educational. In short, the statement is intended as advice for those that stress over little mishaps or dwell on past regrets. Finally, I understand the intent of the statement, but it only addresses symptoms and unintentionally gives license to continue making bad choices. On the other hand, espousing the foundational mindset for treating each other and self eliminates the symptoms by addressing the root cause. We don't stress over mishaps because we acknowledge our good intent and honor human frailty. Furthermore, we understand that we are to own past mistakes and learn from them, but strive to not repeat them nor dwell in the past. We use the past to champion our potential. For example, a man who gives credence to the statement no regrets in spite of having vowed fidelity to his wife, continues affair after affair. How tragic. Especially for his wife and children. It is also tragic if parents or spouses, in an effort to avoid regret, fail to evaluate their speech or actions, and thus fail their spouse or children, and themselves. News flash. It really is okay to be wrong. Being wrong or making mistakes is not the true tragedy. Failing to see it, acknowledge it, admit it and address it can be very tragic. Just imagine the opportunities enabled by espousing and acting on regrets. We must pay attention and evaluate how our words and actions may affect others. Seeking the evaluation of others is also wise. A word of caution, no, too. Wait, it'll be a bunch of cautionary words about using regret. Use it mostly on yourself. If you do use it on others, find a way to make it a positive statement. For example, you played great today. I think our next step is to work on your free throws. Also, careful of overuse on yourself. You must also find and celebrate the good you are doing. In fact, 
that brings us to another great tool called Celebrate the Wins. That sense of accomplishment is rewarding. It does the soul good to celebrate the wins along the path. You know how, right? I will only say this. Celebrate the good times. Come on. Oompa. They say experience is the best teacher, but the school of hard knocks sure can hurt. Why not learn from others' mistakes and their good deeds? Let's observe, listen, ask, discuss and read, seeking wisdom from others. You are engaged in this right now, but you must act on it to reap the benefit. Be aware that this method doesn't etch the lesson into your memory like experience does. You must be consistently proactive. Many years ago, by observing a good deed, I discovered another great tool called directional thinking. I observed the mother really hype up in front of her young daughter what a great artist she was. She even showed off her drawings to us. I'm no art critic, so I cannot confirm nor deny the truthfulness of the mother's assessment, but I could see the effect on her daughter. She now had an image of herself that she'd want to prove to others time and time again, even if in truth her drawings were just mediocre. I considered the positive impact of that approach, even if it had not been truthful. For years, I couldn't reconcile how a lie or half-truth could be a valid approach to effect positive change. Many years later, while attending one of Kurt Duncan's self-improvement seminars, he discussed directional thinking. Then the light came on. It wasn't a statement declaring something to be true, but rather to direct your mind to where you wanted to go in order to effect positive change. For as a man thinketh, so is he. Wait. Might a man currently be less because his current thinking is tainted? Yes. Practically without our conscience awareness, each of us has built a self-portrait that is based on a set of premises that may need adjustment. So in many cases, directional thinking does not directly change a man per se, but rather shed a false narrative. I once heard Russell Nelson, a religious leader, when referring to a changed man, say the greatness of this man emerged. What a way to champion human potential. View others and self as we can become and maybe already are, without all the layers of false narratives piled on from our interpretations of life experiences. Remember when you used to have big dreams? And then life happened and your views changed. What if the meaning you subconsciously assigned to some of life's events is wrong? News flash. It is, and you know it. Admit it. You are more capable than you think and so are others. Wait, does that mean I promote high expectations of self and others? Yes, even an emphatic yes. Well heavens. If it ain't my lifelong friend Don in the studio audience, flailing his arms wildly. What's on your mind, Don? I disagree. Since unhappiness is unmet expectations, low expectations must bring happiness. With full confidence, I declare that the foundational mindset for treating each other and self shatters that premise. Let's say you or your child is at point B and you or they ought to be at point C. To address the issue, we often send a message sprinkled with a bit of condemnation for not having reached point C. As if we'll suddenly move to point C just because we think it or say it. We must start where we are and take steps, expecting some failures along the way. 
this automatically happens if we honor human frailty so let's treat each other and ourselves with kindness and encouragement rather than any level of condemnation so yes high expectations but with whatever measure of patience and compassion required which is more easily done when we honor human frailty let's crown this mother of all episodes with a story that proves we are more capable than we think not long ago i read an article about a 10 year old girl with an iq higher than einstein or hawking she is pursuing two engineering degrees soon thereafter i watched a video about the struggles of highly intelligent people in reference a study that shows that people with a high iq tend to have a low eq or emotional intelligence quotient let's consider that phenomenon i have no doubt that people are born with different levels of potential iq and eq but statistically speaking the distribution of potential high eq would not differ among those with potential high iq so why do those who actually achieve a high iq tend to have a low eq this story answers, at least in part, that question. While pondering this, something occurred to me. It was the certainty that we have at least one child that would be classified as a gifted child. When she started learning addition in school, she excitedly showed me what she could do, even showed off a bit. Just a day or two later, she asked what the tilted plus sign meant. Once I explained multiplication, she immediately understood and enjoyed doing it, long before it was introduced in school. She will soon leave the nest quite prepared to handle adulthood. She is wonderful in many ways, including an admirable student. However, she is not a genius nor a math whiz. So now the question is, what causes young children or us to hold back and hide our abilities? One possibility is that anyone with a reasonable level of EQ doesn't want to excel so much that they no longer fit in. They want to be in the popular herd instead of the nerd herd. I can attest that this was a factor in the case of our daughter. That's one factor that explains why practically the only ones that make it to adulthood still scoring high on the IQ always had a low EQ. Although several other factors exist, my point is simply that we are all more capable than we think. Among the many ways to champion human potential, let's review just those we covered. Use regret wisely. Celebrate the wins. Learn from others. Use directional thinking. Shed false narratives. Set high expectations. You are more capable than you think. Thanks for watching this conclusion of the episode of episodes. Join us next time for the season finale. You'll learn about wet towels, shower curtains and backseat drivers as you discover the power of self-challenge.